All right. Before you're seated, well, let's pray over our time. Father, we thank you for what you're going to do in the next couple minutes. I pray your grace and anointing be on the word and uh, transform us today. Change some people's minds, hearts, thoughts. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in these moments. Jesus, we are your people. Holy Spirit, this is your time. We give you all the glory. We honor your word today in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. hey, before you're seated, look to the person on your right and tell them you look stunning. Stunning is the word today. Now, if the person on the left seems neglected, just turn and say, you're going to be all right. It's going to be all right. <laughs> oh, so good. So good. Well, hey, I just got back uh, last night from a, a pastor's conference in Montana. I was in Kalispell, Montana. I stayed at the lodge at Whitefish Lake. Uh, or at Whitefish at Flathead Lake at the base of Glacier National Park. And uh, Montana's different than California. <laughs> the air's really clean up there. There's lots of elk and things. And uh, it was an amazing conference, and uh, we, we met together. And churches came from all over Montana. I, I discovered something, it, is the airlines don't fly from city to city within Montana. So if you're in Helena or Missoula, you have to fly to Seattle, and then back to Kalispell or wherever you're going. So because of that, the Montanians, or whatever they call themselves, uh, they don't fly from city to city, they drive. And I met people at this, pastors at this conference, drove three hours, five hours, one group drove eight hours to be there. Their whole team dro drove eight hours. I'm like, how do you do that? He goes, Montana, man, it's just the way we think. And I was feeling bad because they kept me at, at the, the Whitefish Lodge at the lake. So there was a frozen lake out in front of me and a field of snow and Glacier National Park. Just a reminder, Dave, you're not in California. And uh, so I felt bad because my driver, he was going 30 minutes. It was 30 minutes to come pick me up. So he had an hour round trip every time he got, got me to the church for the next session. And I said, bro, I feel so bad. He goes, hey, he goes, Dave, it's not a problem. Listen, he said, you're Montana close. <laughs> That's a take home for you, okay? I, I was Montana close. I didn't even know it. So listen, if you, if you commute from, from Woodland or somewhere, or you're Sonoma to Napa or Livermore to East Bay, wherever you, you're Montana close. Thanks for driving in. It's all good, amen? But I want to thank you as a church for allowing me and our other pastors that do a lot of traveling within the week in different places and conferences, and God's using the strength of what goes on in this place to help leaders and pastors be on the walls, amen? Well, hey, we're starting a new series called, would you say it with me? For the One. And for the next four weeks, I, I want to talk to you about the power of being in the house of God and the power of bringing other people into his house. This theme, the title of the series for the one, it comes out of a parable Jesus was talking one day and he used this analogy. He said, if there was, a, there was an individual, there was a man that had a hundred sheep, if one were to wander off and he asked this hypothetical question, wouldn't he leave the 99 and go search for the one? He would go search for the one. And when he brought the one back, there would be celebration and rejoicing. And I just want to remind you that one day you were the one. And God brought you and invited you and gave you a seat at his table. And so for the next four weeks, uh, we're going to ask you to think about who's the one in your life. And I'm sure there's more than one, but let's just go with me on this. What if all of us prayed and invited and had conversations with somebody who's outside the, the house They've wandered off, and we brought them back in to the Father's house, literally, and they met with him. How many of you know God's uh, name would be glorified and angels would rejoice for the one who comes home? And so we're going to do that for the, the next four weeks because there's something supernatural that happens in the house. There's something that only happens in the context of the gathering of believers. And I want to talk to you about that today is actually the power of the gathering, what we do at all locations every Sunday and Thursday night in small groups in our homes. When we gather, there are some promises that are connected to the gathering. And I don't know about y'all, but I love me some church. How about you? I love the house of God. I love to stand right back there on that step and worship Jesus and watch people with their hands raised and greet folks as they come in. Then the Holy Spirit whew, breathes on the worship. And then we hear an amazing testimony of death to life like you heard just a few minutes ago. And people come to Christ and we're built up and it's just all around a good time. I love the house of God. Amen. I'm on David's team. Psalm 122 verse 1 says this. 
I was actually glad. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Would you read that out loud with some passion, all locations, here we go. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Now, I would think that most of you, the vast majority, every campus right now, you are a Christ follower. You're a disciple. Your life has been changed because somewhere at some time, somebody invited you. And they said, hey, come to my small group with me. If you have a study in the word on Wednesday night or come to this night of worship or come down to this church for Sunday morning and the invitation opened a door for you to come into a gathering where your life was transformed. And something we've seen now, as you know, if this is part of, you're part of this house, we just celebrated 25 years. And for 25 years, we've been hearing the testimonies, literally thousands of testimonies of people who said, when I got in the house, something happened. I was changed by the power of the Holy Spirit in the house. And we're going to share a couple of these testimonies with you right now. Check this out. As soon as I sat in the chair, I started bawling. I realized instantly this was our church. After being at church for a couple of years, my son was diagnosed with autism. We didn't know what it all meant. It just hurt. It hurt a lot. And around the same time my husband got laid off, not only were we hurt, we were poor, <laughs> but all we wanted to do was jump into church more and more. Any chance we had to get in the room, we were there. When Pastor Heather found out that we were out of work, she gave me a job in the preschool. When one would take our son, because he was hard to work with, TFH let me bring him here. Pastor Peter put me in charge of the preschool for a few years until we decided to start Champions Club, creating a space for special needs kids and for their parents to be in the house. So now I get to run a program that does for others what we needed years ago. As a special needs mom, there is nothing more important than being at church. I know my kids are looked after and they're loved and they above and beyond are getting what they need and I don't need to worry about that. And I can just go in and I can be fed. It's, you know, me in the room and God, you know, there, you don't get that at home. You can't get that presence that you feel in a room full of a thousand people just loving Jesus at the same time. It took CPS getting involved in mine and my daughter's lives for me to realize I needed a change. And God gave me that opportunity. One day when I was in rehab, some of the guys there invited me to go to the Father's house. The moment that I stepped into that building eight years ago, I realized this was it. This is where God wants me. There is nothing like stepping into this room and realizing this is where you were supposed to be this whole time. My daughter, Brooke, is thriving. She's in her first year of college, and I'm so grateful I have her in my life. I am married to the girl of my dreams, and I just started leading CR. This church has changed my life. You know, if it hadn't been for this church and them allow people from a rehab to come to the church. It was that one day, that one opportunity that I walked through the door and found out that this was home. I came to the Father's house already having a great relationship with God and being a part of another church. I had moved back to Roseville to help out with um, my grandmother. So I was gonna take care of her while I lived out here, but she ended up going to heaven. We had a home church that we grew up in in Rancho, and my sister was like, stop driving all the way out there. Just come check out the Father's house. As soon as you walk on the building, everyone's so welcoming. But I, you know, I was already, I had a home church, so I didn't really feel the need to leave. But it would be like after a couple of visits, Christine would have approached me and just, we instantly connected and she had a small group and then it just kind of took off from there. It would be that very day that I realized I was home. I'm thriving in this place, serving as one of the youth leaders. I'm also the Roseville admin. Me and my daughter are in the house as much as we can be. All of this happened because I kept getting in the building. I kept being a part of the gathering. I walked into this building because my youngest daughter wanted to know Jesus. She was talking to a lot of her little friends they're talking about Jesus and singing songs. And she's like, mom, who's this Jesus? What can he do for me? How can, how can I get to know him? So I'm like, okay, I can show you. I can pull it up on Google. So we did that a couple times. Her godparents gave her a Bible. It was then when she's like, mom, I want to go to church. I want to 
to know him. I want to get to know him. I want to pray with him. I want to do what everybody else says. I want to go to the big building like my friends do. I walked into this building a year ago, and as soon as I walked through the stores, I felt this urge to cry. I couldn't hold back my tears. I felt something I had never felt before. That Sunday has changed my life. I am now part of the Father's House family. I served in Connect and in children's ministry. I was baptized on November 7, 2021. Just knowing that before I felt this emptiness, there's a big difference. I feel full. I feel like I'm constantly getting fed this knowledge and power by God. Come on. Thank you, Lord. I love that testimony. Uh, there's a powerful image that Jesus presented in, in Luke chapter 14, uh, where the master, the father, had prepared a banquet, and he sends out these invitations. But much like the 21st century, everybody was busy and distracted, and they just bought some land, or they had a business deal or a vacation to go on, so they actually rejected the invitation. They ignored the invitation. It sat on the dresser, it sat on the counter, and a seat was left empty. And so Jesus says this in Luke 14. So his master said, go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. Jesus said, I want my house to be full. And it's not that he needs a person in every seat to feel good about himself being God. It's that every seat, there's a name and a face connected with it. And God has a, a place in the house for those who are yet to come to the house I remember um, when God really started moving in, in a unique and really, in hindsight, uh, in a revival way uh, in Three Oaks Community Center about 20 years ago. We moved from the elementary school and we went into the community center. Was anybody there during the community center? Uh, indulge me while I reminisce just a bit, but there was always a party on Saturday night, so was, there was a lot of beer on the floor on Sunday morning, right? So while people worshiped, you could hear, because <laughs> as we worshiped, that was just the sound effects. And, and then there was these helium balloons that would float up to the top of the ceiling from the party the night before. And always by about the third service, because we just did service after service there, by about the third service, the helium would get tired. And while I was preaching, the balloons would slowly fall down and cascade over someone's head. And it used to really bother me, and I was distracted. But after a while, I learned to just go with it. Say, ah, would you welcome our one millionth worshiper right there? It was a great time. But the, the Lord showed me something. I had this reoccurring vision, and vision is a strong word for some, but a mental image while I would be preaching and while I'd be praying, and I, I could see this table, much like the one at the marriage supper of the Lamb may be like when we get there. And uh, It was like God was up at the end of it, and I'd always see a chair pulled out. And in this vision, in this mental image uh, accompanied by the power of the Holy Spirit that would reoccur in my heart, there was a combination of joy and sorrow and the joy was this, all the people at the table. There's just joy on their faces. They were with the master. They'd found their place in the house. But with the empty table, there was always this bit of sorrow and curiosity. And sure enough, someone would come and, and sit in the chair, you know. And as soon as someone sat in the chair, another chair would be pulled out. And we saw this week after week. I didn't know what was going on. I just trying to roll with it, a young church planner. I didn't really know how to preach and teach that well or even give an invitation, but the Holy Spirit was given an invitation. It was all about a chair that was empty and someone belongs, the, the one belongs in this chair. And I wanna tell you today that there's a chair for someone in your world that hasn't been invited to come and sit yet. And all they need is an invitation. All they need is some prayer and a friendly face to have a conversation with them because God has prepared a place. And he says, church, I need you to go out and look behind the hedges and the bushes and shake the, the trees a little bit and find them, compel them, urge them to come. Why? Because the Father has everything that they want and everything that they need. And it's in the house. It's in the gathering. Have you thought about this, that the deep spiritual desire of people's hearts, the longing in their heart they want what you already have. The joy you experience if you're here and you're a Christ follower, you're filled with the Holy Spirit and the love of Christ has set you free as we heard that testimony earlier and you've gone from death to life that people are longing for it. They just don't know yet. They don't know how to articulate the, the deep sorrow and loneliness and this missing ingredient in their life, but it's the person of Jesus. It's a place at the table. So uh, we want to invite them and I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about the power of what we're doing right now 
at every campus, Prison Church Network, those of you that are gathering in your Prison Church campus gathering, and the ladies at Napa State, and I wanna to talk to you about the power of what happens when we come together. You see, the last couple years, two years, we've all learned how to pivot, right? And that word got in your vernacular, your vocabulary like never before, and many of you learned how to work from home, and you became experts at Zoom, and you Zoomed your business meetings, and you Zoom school, and you live streamed church, and we all suffered from a low-grade Zoom fatigue. Some were worse than others, and so we were, we were glad to pivot back to reality and see some breathing bodies again, amen? But we, we learned how to do church in a digital format and thank God for it because there was life and grace on it for sure for that season. But here's a problem that I've seen that many people have not pivoted back to the gathering. And so I want to give you some sound doctrine today and no condemnation if you're on the couch in your slippers eating pancakes. I love you. Jesus loves you. But I'm going to lean into you just a bit. All right. Now, now, let me just say that there is a valid place for digital communication and platforms that we've been using. And like many churches, we have a podcast you can check out. And we have, uh, you, you can find us on a YouTube channel and the live stream and the TFH On Demand. And we have a video archive and all those are valid. In fact, I was just thinking about how thankful I am. We've heard this testimony and over, uh, over and over again. Uh, and we're grateful for all of our military folks uh, that serve here at the house and many get deployed. And I've heard Pastor Dave, while I was in Iraq or Iran or Afghanistan or Qatar or someplace, I was able to tap into the live stream and I was fed. And we thank God for that digital platform or for those who cannot get out of their house. Or maybe you're in a small community in some obscure place somewhere that there is not a life-giving church. We thank God for the power of technology to spread the gospel. But let me be quite clear, virtual ministry is not God's plan for ongoing spiritual maturity and discipleship. That is not, that is not plan A. It's the gathering of the saints. This is his idea, not a denomination or an organization or a man's idea. This is God's idea that we gather together. Every analogy, every description of the church in the New Testament is connected, gathered, built together, doing life together. And I want to give you very quickly, uh, I'm going to give you seven things that happen in the gathering, seven things. And I would argue that they're exclusive to the gathering. Now, uh, I'd like to have some interaction today to keep you alive and awake and, and connected. Uh, take notes, uh, and the, you know, the survey proves that people go to heaven quicker when they take notes, or more often, not quicker, like someone's thinking, I don't want to check out today, if that's what you're offering. Like there's a shuttle in the lobby, you know? But I, I believe notes are good for you. They get you, they get you engaged. But let me give you seven things that, that happened in the gathering. Number one, sharing the Lord's Supper. Communion. Now, I'm going to read some verses in the next few minutes, and we're going to go through these seven things rapid fire, and, and I would ask you for some audience participation. Here's what we're going to do. Every time you see the bold on the side screens or the underline, all locations, I want you to read out with some passion the bold and the underline. Okay, you guys up for it? So I'll read, and then you'll be queued up as when to read. So sharing the Lord's Supper in communion is something that only happens in the gathering. Look at this, Acts 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week, we gathered with the local believers to share. Like, zealous. I love that. We gathered with the local believers to share. We shared in the Lord's Supper. Acts 2.46, they worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals. And they shared with great joy and generosity. So here's, here's a tip, something quite obvious. You can't share in isolation. You can't break bread by yourself. You need someone to break bread with. And yes, I'm acutely aware of the metaverse and the new you know, prophesied trend that will happen in the body of Christ where you're gonna sit home with your headset on and your 3D glasses and your helmet and you're gonna go to virtual church. Has anybody been tapping into that? Three of us, okay. It, it's coming to a screen near you or a headset near you. But, but here's my observation, and it's not just because I'm the old guy, but maybe because I am the old guy. But in the virtual church reality, you can, you can virtually attend church, you can virtually worship, you can virtually break bread, you can virtually take a cup and virtually drink it, and virtually nothing will happen to you. Why? 
Because God said, I want my people to come together, to gather together on the Lord's day and to take bread and to break it and to say, this is the Lord's body broken for you. And when you do this, the Holy Spirit will rest upon you and people will be healed and transformed. So the Lord's Supper, number two, the sharing of our resources. The sharing of our resources, helping the hurting. Here we go, you're ready to read, Acts 2.44. And all the believers met in Napa, are you guys lifting your voice out there? I trust you are, thank you. They met together in one place and they shared everything they had. You know this, but generosity is an attribute of God himself. It's a part of the atmosphere of heaven and it happens in the gathering. And you might say, well, Dave, you know, I'm home watching the stream and, and I tithe, I'm a tither, I give and praise God as you should. But listen, you're only gonna be compassionate and give your life with people you're connected with. You see, it says in Acts, the verse you just read, that they shared everything, not just financially, they shared their gifts, their compassion, their homes, their clothing, their time. And, and you're not going to share your life with people that you're disconnected from. There's something that happens, listen, and you guys know this because there's probably 80 percentile of the adults at the Father's house that are involved in a small group. Can we just give it up for our small group ministries, all locations? And you know this, rows are great, we love rows on the weekend, but circles are better. There's something that happens when you sit down with eight or 10 people in a living room and someone starts sharing what they're going through. Or their son just got admitted to the hospital for a condition, or they can't afford to pay their utility bill. Guess what the body of Christ does every time? They step up. Has anybody been a recipient of people stepping up? It, come on, wave at me. But that doesn't happen without connection. Without community, life is shared in the context of the gathering. First Corinthians 14, oh, excuse me, let me go to number three. My bad, I jumped ahead. The operation of our gifts. I, this is the third one. The operation of our gifts, both to give and receive. And the gifts of the Spirit are given to build each other up in a world that's trying to tear us down. First Corinthians 14, 26. I'll let it come on the screen. Lift up your voice. Ready? Here we go. When you come together. Can we read that again? When, when you come together, something's gonna happen. Each person has a vital role because each has gifts. And Pastor Joseph was talking about that. The discover class, the discover experience is to help you discover your gifts so that you can serve one another and be fulfilled in your Christian journey. So you get together and someone's got a song, another has something to teach, another has a revelation from God. One person might speak in an unknown language, another will offer the interpretation, but all of this should be done to what? Strengthen the life and the faith of the community. See, the gifts are designed for community. And if I'm just sitting home on the stream and I'm, I'm getting fed, well, what about the people that need to get fed through me? What about the gifts that I need to infuse into somebody else? And so we all have gifts and God's designed the gathering to strengthen and build one another up. Number four is impartation. Impartation is the transfer of gifts, the transfer of anointing and the transfer of faith. Romans 1.11, I'll let it come up and then we'll, here we go, let's lift our voice. I long to see you so that I may impart. Now this is the Apostle Paul. Paul is writing a letter to the Romans, but he hadn't been there yet, and he's on his way to the church in Rome, and he said this, I want to see you. I want to see you face to face so that I can impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. Read into it, and here's the conclusion. Paul could not impart strength and faith and gifts through a letter, and he wrote a lot of great letters. His letters were so good, we're still reading them 2,000 years later, powerful letters. He could not impart through a messenger. He said, I need to be with you so that I can impart to you strength and spiritual gifting. And one of the foundational applications of faith and power and gifting is found in Hebrews chapter six. It is the laying on of hands. The laying on of hands is not charismatic behavior. It's not Pentecostal church performance. It's New Testament Christianity. God has chosen the simple things of the world to confound the wise. And when we lay hands on one another, when we pray for each other, there's an infusion of faith. There's an impartation. There's revelation. There's the gifts of the Spirit. But it doesn't happen until I lay my hand upon you. 
And during this conference, I mentioned earlier in, in Montana, there was lengthy ministry times, and uh, I got to pray for dozens and dozens of pastors and church planters, and I prayed for one couple that's just leaving to Kosovo to do one of the, a church plant there in, in Kosovo, and, and something unique happens in those settings. I can be talking to somebody, and I really don't know the heart and the mind of the Lord, but as soon as I lay hands on them to pray, something shifts, and I start hearing from heaven. And I can operate in that gift of prophecy when I lay hands. Now, you know, the last couple years you've been trained and rebuked not to touch people. Stay away from people. Keep your distance, bro. People got offended if you got too close. Which is how we know that the impetus of the pandemic was demonic in nature. Because one of the greatest weapons against your spiritual growth is isolation. And scientific study and and psychologists have finally caught up with biblical knowledge, and it's this. Isolation is one of the worst punishments that people can go through. That solitary confinement is cruel and inhumane. Why? Because you were designed for the human touch. You were designed for hugs and smiles and for someone to lay hands on you and you to lay. Well, let me just say it this way, bro. You need a hug, man. You need a hug. All locations, look over at somebody that, that you love and know and just tell them, I think you need a hug. Go ahead and tell them. Rose will tell them. East Bay, I think you need a hug. Now, if, you, if you're single here today, that might have been a great moment for you. <laughs> Try to capitalize on that right down through here. You're welcome. I'm here to serve. <laughs> now, if you're a visitor and you're sitting by somebody and that was awkward, maybe just look at them, raise one eyebrow and go, you need a hug? <laughs> I was like, come on, dear, get the car. Our last visit here, we're out. <laughs> the truth is that we need impartation. It's not just physical, it's spiritual, and it happens in the gathering. Look at this, 1 Timothy 4, 14. Do not neglect the spiritual gift you received through the prophecy spoken over you when the elders of the church did what? Laid their hands on you. They laid their hands on you. The primary and most obvious way impartation takes place and healing takes place is through the laying on of hands. Number five, the mutual transfer of courage. This is huge. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And let us consider thoughtfully how we may encourage one another to love and to good deeds. Here we go. Not forsaking our meeting together. Meditate on that. Don't forsake, don't neglect the meeting, the gathering as believers for worship and instruction, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. Here we go. And all the more faithfully as you see the day of Christ's return approaching. Hey, where are we at on the timeline? We came out of 2020, though. Whoo, glad that's over. 2021, punch in the face. Whoo, glad that's over. Looks like, you know, the graphs are going down, and then Ukraine and Russia and trade and your gas prices and on and on. Are we, in fact, at the beginning of birth pains that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24? I'm not an eschatology buff, but I do believe we are. And if, in fact, we're headed into that season of the beginning of birth pains, which get more frequent and more intense, how much more should we encourage one another faithfully as we see the day of Christ's return approaching? It's not time to be isolated. In isolation, your theology gets weird. In isolation, you get critical. In isolation, you get offended. In isolation, you get judgmental. But when we're together, you're able to transfer courage into somebody who's feeling weak, and I'm able to receive some courage from you, and I need some of that. The Greek word for encouraging or courage is parakaleo. It means to walk alongside and infuse courage, infuse strength and comfort. This is the same Greek word that Jesus used when he said, I'm going away, but I'm going to send the comforter to you, the helper, the advocate, the intercessor, the counselor, the strengthener, and he's going to come alongside of you. And just as the Holy Spirit walks with you every day, he infills you, he comes upon you and baptizes you with power, and then he literally walks beside you. He walks beside you into that interview. He walks beside you into that hospital room. He never leaves you or forsake you. When Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you even until the ends of the earth. He was talking about the comfort and partnership of the parakletos, which would be the strength that stays right next to you. You can't get that virtually. 
And we are to be that for one another. The Holy Spirit in you is to be the strength and the comfort. Now, just reason for a moment, if strength and courage and comfort are a byproduct of community, then what is the byproduct of isolation? Perhaps it's fear and weakness and anxiety. And this is why we need to gather together. Number six, things that only happen in the gathering. The authority of God resting on the gathering of worshipers. There's a promise of God's authority and power that comes upon the gathering. Just as you lifted your voice so beautifully a few minutes ago and the band backed off and you all began to sing, how great is our God. And there was, I don't know if you noticed it, but there was a shift, there was a weight, there was a authority of the Lord that was released. And Psalm 22, three says, but you are holy, enthroned upon the praises, plural, of Israel. And this word enthroned in Hebrew, yasab, it means to sit down, to take one's place, to inhabit and to remain. And there's an authority that comes. It's a weightiness. It's, it's God himself. He says, when my people come together and they lift up their praises, the Hebrew word tehillah means this spontaneous song of adoration. And it's kind of that moment when you don't have to read the, the karaoke words on the screen. The band's not supporting the worship. It's the voices of the saints, the priests. You carry the presence, and, and I'm tempted to go back and just hit the one chord and, and do this for a moment, but I'll refrain. But there's, there's something, you've seen this. When God's people all together just begin to lift their voice, it shifts the atmosphere. This is a promise that is exclusive to the gathering. Now, why is that so important? It feels good. We notice an atmosphere change, yet yeah, it feels like God's in this room. Well, it goes far beyond that. Because when the king is enthroned upon the praises of Israel, it means that his authority arrests and displaces every other authority. That when the authority of God comes upon the gathering, the authority of depression has to leave. The authority of anxiety is diminished. The authority of sickness is overcome and healing takes place. Our minds get clear. Our life gets strengthened when we worship together. Worship is not the warm-up for the sermon. Worship is entering into the very holy of holies and creating a throne room for the very power and presence of God. So don't show up 15 minutes late for church. You see what I did there? I went from this strong, encouraging moment. Went, Preach that, pastor, straight to rebuke. And you were like, did I just get rebuked? Yes. <laughs> it's important that you're here. We need your voice. We need your passion. I'll, I'll, I'll move on. <laughs> While the love is still in the room. <laughs> and the last one, number seven, we got there quickly. The manifest presence of Jesus among us. This is what I just discussed only at another level. Look at this, Hebrews 2.12. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, speaking of the church. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. Everybody say it together. In the assembly. Say it again. In the assembly. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. What is this talking about? It's a prophetic word that Jesus will sing in the midst of the congregation that his voice is heard. I love Zephaniah 3.17, one of my favorite verses, that he will quiet you with his love and he will rejoice over you with singing. Something happens in the gathering as Jesus shows up to the gathering and his voice is heard in the worship service. He sings among his brethren. He sings and lifts his voice and the voice of the Holy Spirit is heard in the house of God because he sings over his people. Revelation 2.1, it tells us that Jesus walks among us. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and he walks. Now, the seven golden lampstands, that's a reference to the seven churches in Asian Minor, which those letters were distributed to all the churches for all time until he returns again. So when he says he walks among the lampstands, it means he walks in this room. He walks in the church. He walks among the gathering. And in this setting, there's, there's a place that transformation happens, but it doesn't happen if I miss the gathering it doesn't happen if, if I'm not taking my seat in the house. And what we're asking you to do, first of all, and, and with all the love and compassion I can muster, if you're a Christ follower and you're in proximity to a life-giving church that is your community, please come back. 
Gather, don't forsake the assembling together. This is not a rebuke. It's a loving invitation to get in the place you were meant to be so that you can mature and, and be a disciple and encourage others and use your gifts. Come back to the house. Get in the house. But see, we want to go out, we want to shake the bushes, and we want to find the one. Anybody, when I say the one, maybe someone comes to your mind. Who is it in your world that is far from God? Maybe they used to go to church 10, 15 years ago. They got bitter, they got twisted, and they're cynical and jaded. Maybe they, they, they're throwing mud at the church, you know, but they're not happy. And I'm telling you, maybe it's a conversation away. Maybe it's an invitation away, and maybe we'll see that vision again at the table and this chair being pulled out, and they come and they, they pull up a seat. When uh, we started planning this, this four-week series, uh, I was supposed to have a card for you this morning, but they got delayed in the printers. Everything's weird and slow these days, but I, I was going to hand you a card that looked exactly like this, so now you know what you're missing. You're welcome. <laughs> but fear not. Uh, we have a digital version. This will come on the screen. And uh, this week, you can get this on the app, and then Monday, you're all going to get an email if you're on the email list. If you're not, please get on there, and we'll share with you some instructions. And and here's what we want you to do with the thank you card. And you can buy your own thank you card, but here's what I want to do in this moment at all locations. I want you right now in this moment to think of that one person. And there might be several. But first off, is there a person that invited you to church the first time you went and your life was changed? Or is there someone who kept saying, you got to come with me. You got to come to CR. You got to get, you need to celebrate recovery, bro. Or you need to come to our Bible study. I was pr prophesying over somebody over there, I guess. Come to this night of worship, and your life was changed and transformed. Or maybe you grew up in church, but there's somebody in your life that mentored you and poured into you. I want you to think about it, and if you need to, grab your pen and write it down in the margin of your Bible, write it down on a piece of paper. And I want you this week to thank the person that pulled out the chair for you. And I believe it's gonna set us up to be that person for somebody else. I was thinking about who invited me to church, and I realized I wasn't invited to church. I was forced to church. <laughs> right? My dad was a preacher, and we went to church five, seven times a week. I don't know. It just seemed like every day. Whether you need it or not, boy, get in the house of God. Yes, sir. Called my dad the admiral for several good reasons. But they, they took me to church. In fact, true story, many of you know it. Uh, my mom went into labor on Sunday morning at church with me. Got up out of the worship service, went to Long Beach Memorial, and voila, you're welcome. <laughs> now, knowing my parents, they're probably back for Sunday night service, right? That's how they roll back in the day. Um, but I, I never missed church, and I didn't always enjoy it, and it was a forced behavior, but I realized something because of my father's commitment, who's now 84 years old, living in Roseburg, Oregon, watching the stream, love you, Dad. Because of his faithfulness, I am who I am today because someone took me to the house of God. Let me just lean into the parents a little bit. They may not always want to go to church. Ah, they love our kids' church. We've had so many kids drag their parents to the father's house, kicking and scratching. And then at some point, the parents actually enjoy the experience as much as the kids. We have a brilliant kids' ministry. But then, you know, your kids get 12, 13, 14, and they're just too cool for school, and they don't want to come to church. Keep bringing them. I wrote this to my dad just to share with you guys this intimate moment here. Hey, Dad, thank you for taking me to church before I knew what church was. In fact, before I was born, I probably never missed a service for nine months. <laughs> thank you for raising me in the house of God where I learned about Jesus and the fear of the Lord. We didn't always get it right. There have been setbacks and failures along the way. But the bottom line is this, without your commitment to Jesus and me being raised in his house, I would not be who I am today. Thank you, your son, Dave. Let's have the band come on out. So if you would, it's gonna help you. It's gonna bless that person. Send the thank you note. Get the digital version. You can get it through your app. You can send an email, or you can go old school, pen to paper, put a stamp on it. Anybody remember that process? It's still out there. Very effective. And then we're going we're gonna to see who we can pull out a chair for in the next few weeks. 
we're going to prayerfully consider, and don't miss next week, it's going to be very important as we put together a prayer list of some folks you're going to want to pray for and invite. And You know, as we think about that, all this consummates and ends, this series lands on Easter Sunday. And at all locations, we're going to preach Jesus crucified and resurrected. The music's going to be incredible. The anointing's going to be thick. And we're going to set a table for people far from God. And as they fill extra services at all locations, we're going to see thousands of people come to Jesus in a month. But it won't happen without you pulling out a seat at the table. Now, as you think about the one, the one you got to shake the bushes and reach for the one, you might think, well, Pastor Dave, the person I'm thinking about, <laughs> they probably wouldn't come to church. And if they did, they would not fit in here. How many of you remember my sermon about you need some sketchy friends? Go back and review that because you do. This is a sketchy friend, uh, just friendly is I guess the word. Sketchy friend, friendly atmosphere and environment we're creating here at the Father's house. What I'm saying, it's a safe place for messed up people. I want to read you this quote before we pray from Philip Yancey. Jesus would accept almost anybody's invitation to dinner as a result And as a result, no public figure had a more diverse list of friends, ranging from rich people, Roman centurions and Pharisees, to tax collectors, prostitutes, and leprosy victims. People love being with Jesus because where he was, joy was. And I'm telling you, as you invite people, they may not be comfortable going to church, but there'll be something that'll resonate in their heart that they know, hey, I think there's a table there. I think there's a seat that I need to sit in. So that's what we're going to do for the next four weeks. And before we conclude today, I want to ask you all locations and in just a minute, you go into a time of prayer, but are you that one? Is it time for you to say, hey, I'm in the building, but I'm not at the table? Are are you here today or watching on the stream? You'd say, Pastor Dave, I, I sense the Holy Spirit saying, come. Have a seat. I prepared some things for you. Perhaps it's your day to say yes to Jesus and take your place and join the gathering and become one of his disciples. And today I want to clearly invite you to say yes to him.